this for my dad because he says my voice sounds much better on video than he his does. He is the one gambling his fingertips with the power of tools here, not me. About a year ago, we took a trip to England and visited the historical city of York, where we bought a game called King and Country. The game has five pieces and needs four by ten grid to play on. The set that we bought didn't have a game board with it and the pieces were a little wobbly. So I sanded down their bases and then set about making a board to play on and a box to store them in. Rather than buying materials, I decided to use locally sourced wood. By the way, if you've never been to the historical city of York, I highly recommend it. It's fascinating. I started by joining some pieces of cedar, then cutting them into strips on the table saw. Cedar cuts beautifully and has the added benefit of making the shop smell like a bath and body works afterwards. Next, I took some, well, I'm not sure what this was. It cut like oak and we think it may have been white oak, but we're not sure. Whatever it was, I wanted the light golden color to contrast with the red of the cedar for the game board. I set the fence on the table saw and began ripping the strips to a uniform width. Then it was ready for the first glow up. During a heavy rainstorm, I used some hardwood calls wrapped in painter's tape to make sure they didn't attach themselves to any squeeze out, and laid it on some paper so it didn't glue itself to the workbench overnight. Actually, that piece of paper was the hand-drawn board we were playing on while we were in England. By the next day, everything was nice and dry. I was able to peel off the calls. My very rustic cross-cut sled was used to square up the ends and then, with the help of a stop block, cut uniform horizontal strips from the newly glued up board. Every other strip could then be flipped around to create the checkerboard pattern. If you've seen any of the thousands of cutting board videos on YouTube, you're probably familiar with the step. Then it was time for another glue up, and this time with the help of a couple of pipe clamps to apply even pressure on the edges. After a bit of manual alignment and a lot of glued fingertips, it was ready to dry. After it had dried and off camera, I ran each face through the jointer to flatten it. For the box, I used Bradford Pear. We'd had a log drying out for a few years and it had seemed like a good time to attempt some milling. After realizing there was nothing in the shelf big enough to do a clean straight cut on a log this big, the sawzall was used to do a very rough rip cut along the edge. With that piece removed, it could just barely fit the bandsaw for another rough rip cut. With two almost square sides and reduced dimensions, it was narrow enough to go over the jointer. And after a few passes, it was ready to go through the planer. That resulted in a nicely squared up hunk of wood, which I could cut up some boards from. Ha! Just kidding. Here's the real piece. There were plenty of cracks and fissures in the wood, so I had to be careful about which side to cut the boards from in order to maximize the usable wood. It was still far too thick for the table saw blade to do in one pass, so I had to flip it over and run it through again. This was my first time working with Bradford Pear. The wood was dense, dark, and dusty, and it was filled with wormholes. The table saw left some blade marks on the boards, but those were easily cleaned up with a light pass on the joiner. I then cut pieces for the sides of the box after estimating how deep it would need to be to comfortably hold the game pieces. A magnetic stop on the table saw was used for some repeatable cross cuts to make matching long and short sides. I've never done box joints before, so I made the router jig and used half inch router bit to cut them. I would call it a finger joint jig, but the goal here is to not route your fingertips, which fortunately I managed. This jig is a little scary and loud and dusty. And did I mention scary? The box joints were quite tight and needed a little work with a file to get them to fit right. 
the game board also was a tight fit and required some work with a block plane to get it to slip in snugly. After cleaning up the box frame and letting it dry overnight, I glued in the game board to the top. I had considered doing this all in one step, but I figured it would be better to do it separately. I added some gentle pressure from a few clamps, of which one can never have too many of, and left it to dry. For the base of the box, I was going to use some leftover pieces of Bradford pear, but they weren't quite wide enough. It gave me the idea to glue them up with some of the other offcuts and make a decorative bottom. Heh, <laughs> that sounds funny. I cut some thin strips of the white oak and a broad strip of cedar to go down the center of the base. I glued them up and clamped them with the pipe clamps, but had to do a bit of repair work the next day because of an unstable crack in the cedar. While the repair work dried, I used a flush trim bit to even up the box joints at each corner of the frame. Once that was done, I used the joiner to flatten the faces of the base, the base faces, if you will. I also took this opportunity to flatten the top face of the box and the bottom of the frame so that the base would glue on tightly. I was careful to align the base so that the red and white racing stripe would be properly centered and then clamped it down. The box was starting to really take shape now, and I realized that what I started as a fun school building project had turned into something quite nice that I had a lot of time and effort invested in. It's around this point in a project that I start to get nervous about messing up. After it had dried, I once again used the jointer, this time to flatten the underside. I did it with multiple light passes as I was concerned about gouging the wood. The bandsaw made quick work of the excess overhang, and then the trusty flush trim bit took care of the remainder. At this point, the box was really starting to look good, which made the next part even more nerve-wracking. Because it was completely sealed, I still had to cut the lid off. I was going to use the table saw, but figured the blade was too thick and would ruin the appearance of the box joints, so I used the bandsaw instead. I went slow, and I'm pretty sure I held my breath the entire time, but it came out just fine in the end. In order to clean up the blade marks and get a nice tight fit, I passed the underside of the lid and an open face of the box frame over the jointer on its shallowest setting. I then cut some inserts for the lid to hold it in place. I cut these at exactly 45 degrees, so naturally there were gaps in the final miter joint. I don't know why, but I can never seem to get those gapless miter joints. Oh well, this was supposed to be a fun skill building project after all. And yes, I definitely need a better camera mount. That table saw generates a lot of vibration through the shop floor. I routed a very shallow chamfer along the underside of the box to create a shadow line. Cleaned off as much dust as possible and then applied some Danish oil to finish. <sighs> Danish oil. The various passes through the jointer and the saws had caused a bit of chip out on the side of the box where a wormhole was, but this had added some character. It also helps indicate which way around the lid goes on. You may notice that one row of squares is a lot narrower than the others. This is because that's the defense line in King and Country, and has nothing whatsoever to do with me miscalculating the kerf on my saw blade when cross-cutting the strips. As I said at the beginning, the wood is all locally sourced. The cedar is from my father-in-law, my papa. The Bradford pear is from a tree in our backyard, and the white oak, or whatever it is, well, we found that at the side of the road. King and Country is a quick game for two players. One person plays defense and has four pieces. The other plays offense and has the remaining piece. The offense piece can move forwards, backwards, left, or right, not diagonal, one square at a time. The defense pieces can only move forward one square at a time. Two pieces cannot occupy the same space, and there are no captures. The goal is to get a piece to the opposing player's starting line. It's very easy to learn. For most people. Oh, come on.
Thanks for watching. See you next time. Goals. It could just barely fit the bandsaw for another rough rip at. <laughs> but the goal here is to not root your fingertips. Right. You're saying it like an English person. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> and requires some work with a block pane. Plane. Plane. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. And requires some work with a block plane to get it to slip in snugly.